Hey, thanks for sticking around first. I know it's been a long day and we've had some amazing presentations so far. So let's start this one by congratulating everyone. Let's give them a round of applause. Cool. So I'm Horia. Um, I've been a software engineer at Spotify for almost two years now. And during this time, I had the opportunity to work with some fantastically talented people. Uh, on problem domains such as subscriber churn and retention, payment gateways, um, product integrations and campaigns. Now, before we start the talk, I want to ask you a few questions. How many of you here are using Spotify? Wow, <laughs> cool. How many of you here have ever paid for Spotify before? Okay, so this is what I do. My team and I take care of all things related to your Spotify subscription. So if you're familiar with online payments, you know that every time you have to get out your credit card, you get slightly annoyed. That's why payment methods like Klarna really appeal to customers. Everyone wants it to be easy and just work, but the reality is that it takes a lot of effort to streamline the process and make it easier for the user. And this is what this talk is about. It's taking the lid off of online payments and look at how we handle what's inside. We're going to see how Spotify Payments builds APIs to manage complexities. So to start, let's look at how Spotify Payments has evolved over time, how we got to where we are today. So as you might already know, Spotify was developed by a small team here in Stockholm back in 2006. But it wasn't until late October 2008 that the application was successfully launched in five different markets, as you can see, mostly the Nordics, and we only accepted credit card payments. So by the end of 2011, We've added seven more markets, including the United States, and PayPal as an alternative payment method. It was clear to us that the company wanted to expand in, many countries, in as many countries as possible, as fast as possible. So to best support this, uh, we started experimenting with new ways of paying for uh, Spotify. So in no more than two years, we were able to add 42 new markets and a wider variety of payment methods, like Facebook payments uh, and Klarna. We quickly learned that people all over the world, they want to pay in different ways for Spotify. So we shifted our focus from global payment methods to more local ones. So before the end of 2015, we partnered with Adyen, and we were able to implement no less than nine different local payment methods, including bank transfer and preloaded cash cards, in markets where we've previously seen um, a very low credit card penetration. And this has had a huge impact on brand and marketing, uh, on marketing and brand engagement. So this takes us back to the present. Spotify has reached a whopping 40 million paying subscribers in 60 different markets, including Japan. And our focus for the past year has been on helping our users select the most convenient payment method for them. So what are payments? I'm going to share with you one thing. Before I joined Spotify and I applied for the position of software engineer in payments, I thought I was more than qualified for it, to be honest. I feel like payments, I've implemented PayPal before, right? It can't be that complicated. So just so you have a better understanding, most of Spotify's revenue today comes from paid products, such as subscriptions and gift cards. So ideally, if our users would walk to our door every month to pay us $10 for their Spotify subscription, we would be done. There's nothing left to do, right? But the reality is that this is a much more complex process. And to understand that complexity of payments at Spotify, we're going to look together today at an example using credit cards. So it all starts with the users going to their bank, opening a bank account, and getting a credit card, right? Super simple. Then they receive an email, or they click on an ad, and they end up on Spotify.com, and they start typing their credit card information. Now, the Spotify back payment backend at this point will try to validate the payment details, meaning their credit card information. And if the validation is successful, based on some particular market or product, the payment backend will then attempt to authorize this payment and talk to a payment provider. And the payment provider will contact the bank through the credit networks and it will make sure to set aside the $10 for your Spotify subscription. Finally, the bank confirms that the purchase is possible and the response comes all the way back to the payment backend through the credit network. Now, at this point, users have access to millions of songs by unlocking the power of Spotify Premium, right? This is probably the most common flow in payments, and probably the simplest one. So from the previous example, 
you probably figured it, all right, uh, figured it out already that we have three key components in the overall system architecture at Spotify. We have the checkout page, we have the payment backend, and then the payment provider. So in reality, we have more than one payment provider. In fact, we're working right now with 16 different ones, all of which have specific API implementations. And to be able to deal with this complexity, we created two major sets of APIs. A checkout API, which describes how to implement the payment experience. It allows us at Spotify to build flows the way we want them to. It enables us to remove friction and make it easier for our users to pay for Spotify. And then the billing API. The billing API abstracts away the details of payment providers and credit networks. It translates provider-specific language into one single API call. So basically, the billing API allows the backend to ask one single question, and that is, can I charge this user X amount of money? Let's go a bit into more details on a, about the first major component that I've talked about, the checkout API. So the Spotify payment backend, as I've told you before, tries to validate some payment details and start this whole complicated authorization process meaning the communication with payment provider. But in order to do that, it first needs to gather bits and pieces of information. Now, you can think of them like a lot of moving parts from a lot of different sources. And some of that information might be required by payment providers, but the rest is required by Spotify internally. So where do you think the backend gets all this information? Well, from a wide variety of clients, of course. It can be anything from your mobile phone, your tablet, your laptop, including your television set. So as you can see, there's so many variables in this equation. So we at Spotify decided to make our clients stateless and our backend responsible for taking the decisions. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that the payment backend is responsible for what the process is and what are the next steps. And the clients are responsible for providing rich experiences. They're responsible on how the required information is being collected. And they're responsible for sending it back to the payment backend. So to facilitate this back and forth communication between the payment backend and the clients, we ended up creating the checkout API. And let's take a closer look together at a possible checkout experience on Spotify. So ultimately, for us to succeed in the payment world, we just need to give the user the ability to input its credit card details, right? If the details are valid, we can then show them the confirmation page and give them access to Spotify Premium. Sounds super simple so far. But what if we want to inject an extra step in this checkout experience? For example, in some countries, users are required to fill in additional tax information. And the Spotify payment backend, remember, that's responsible for taking the decisions, needs to inform the clients of the existing of this additional, existence of this additional step. Then the clients are responsible to collect the required information through some specific implementations. You can think about it this way. Your mobile phone needs to have a tax information form and it, it needs to know how to respond to the payment backend request. So it needs to display the tax information form to be able to collect that information. Well, based on the product, you might have an extra step in the checkout experience, which is collecting billing addresses. The same thing happens. The backend decides what the next step is, and the clients collect this data through a specific form. So remember how we talked about users ending up on Spotify.com uh, through a link in their email or clicking on an ad? So what if the email has an offer code, which unlocks this entire checkout experience, so you're not able to access this unless you have a valid code? So as you've figured it out by now, um, the key API that makes possible this complex experience is the checkout API. So the checkout API sits between the payment backends and the clients. It allows us at Spotify to build flows the way we want them to build, and it translates the backend requirements into actions that the clients can understand. I know I've talked about having specific implementations, like the billing address form or the tax information form. Those are in the clients, right? And those are a finite number of implementations. But the purchase flow, or the checkout experience, as we like to call it at Spotify, it can, have any, like, it can be any flow you could imagine. So we can start by having the credit card information, just collecting the billing address after that, and showing the confirmation page. Or it can be credit card form, tax information, billing address, and then the confirmation for, uh, form. So there are an infinite amount of possible flows that we can create with a finite number of specific implementations. And the checkout API handles all that complexity. 
So let's take a closer look together how an anatomy of a step looks like in the, in the checkout API world. So the client here initiates the purchase, talks to the checkout API, and then the checkout API asks the payment backend, what is the first step? Then the payment backend responds by saying, you need to collect credit card information. And the checkout translates that for the clients in something like, well, you need to display a credit card form. The checkout API then collects all that information, and it sends the credit card data through the checkout API to the payment backend. And finally, the payment backend says, OK, we got everything we needed. It's OK for you to show the confirmation. And checkout translates that for uh, the client into display the confirmation page. So we need to remember two things here. Right? The backend decides what the next step is, and the clients need to know what to do, have a specific implementation for executing the task of collecting this data. So every time we want to add a new step, the business logic is actually sitting on the backend, and the only requirements that the clients need to fulfill is to have a form or any kind of implementation to be able to collect that data. And we at Spotify are sometimes adding new steps into the payment experience based on user, country, product, the tests or experiments that we're running, or different payment methods that we're implementing. So what are the advantages of having the checkout API? I, first big advantage is that it, you can change the checkout experience without a client release. Um, just to give you an example, my team and I recently implemented the 3D Secure for a few payment providers without any client release at all. Then clients can build native experience. So what, does this, what this means in reality is that you could use any device to collect the information. You can collect the credit card information using a VR headset. You can talk through voice commands to Alexa. Uh, and remember that the client might already know the answer. So for example, if you've already paid for something on a website, you're going to have stored payment details, so it can use that. And there's a finite number of client implementations, as I said before, and it allows us to have an infinite number of possible flows. The other component that we shortly mentioned was the billing API. So we know by now that we're dealing with a wide variety of clients that collect some sort of information. They send everything over through the checkout API in this multi-step process. And then the checkout API tries to build a set of payment details uh, that the payment backend then tries to validate, right? So if these details are valid, the backend will communicate with the payment providers in an attempt to charge the user. And the communication with the payment providers, you need to understand, is not a direct communication, and for several good reasons. So all the payment providers have different APIs, they exhibit different behaviors, uh, they're based on different business logic. For example, payments with credit cards are instant, but payment for bank transfer can, can take up to three to five days to finalize. So this is where the billing API comes into play for Spotify, right? It translates different implementations of providers into something that we can work with. Remember, we have 16 different providers. So to manage all that complexity, the billing API hides the details from the payment backend into the one single call we've previously talked about. Can I charge the user X amount of money? And one single response, yes or no. So among other things, the billing API is also responsible for producing correct financial data, for handling settlement and reconciliation, from call, for callbacks from providers. But probably the most important role, it enables us at Spotify to compare payment methods. So think about this. Think about when you're paying with PayPal. You log into your PayPal account, you click a few buttons, and you've paid for something. Versus if you're using carrier billing, where you have to send an SMS to actually finalize the transaction. It also enables us to build better tooling. And I'm going to dive into an example about how we do monitoring for our APIs at Spotify. Automatic alerts. So obviously, the payment uh, system is critical for Spotify, right? We want our users to be able to pay no matter when or where. And we still want to continue process re processing recurring payments, handle your subscription renewal every month. So we built a tool that automatically sends us alerts for what we call anomaly detection. The billing API takes the things that the providers do and turns it into a consistent stream of events, which enables monitoring and filtering. Now, let me give you an example of 
at some type of events that we're able to produce and use in our anomaly uh, detection system. So think about 16 different payment methods, think about how different they are, but at the end of the day, by having the billing API, we're able to produce these events. I mean, these are a bit simplified, but most of the information is there. This is how we're able to compare them. So it's a simple yet effective technique that we use at Spotify. We basically keep track of the received payment transactions, the ones we actually process, versus the failed payment transactions that we have. So the system looks at values uh, 15 minutes ago, one week ago, and one month ago, and compares them to the current value. And by doing this comparison, the system is able to detect things like that. We know when someone deployed a change that broke initial payments, and we get an alert. Or if one of our payment providers is having an issue. If you look at the patterns, you'll immediately notice that something's wrong there. And while that particular payment provider had an issue, the rest of them continued working just fine. What are the advantages of having such monitoring to your APIs? Well, there's a fairly low number of false positives, although we sometimes do encounter different spikes over short periods of time, but they're not too many. It works super well for our high volume providers like Adyen. It doesn't work very well for batch requests, though. And it makes us more aware of local events like bank holidays, bank employee strikes, individual schedules. Think about this scenario for a moment, and this is real. We have a small payment provider in some market um, that's responsible of sending us at Spotify batch requests. Now, if that person is late for work, stuck in traffic or on holiday, we're going to get an alert in the middle of the night. So we're, we're coming uh, close to the end of the talk, but what I want to share with you is how I believe that API design has helped Spotify in the journey to conquer this world of subscriptions. And there are a few, uh, are a few key things to remember here. One is that we create APIs to hide or manage complexities for having to deal with so many clients as, uh, and providers, and it's not going to get any simpler from now. We build APIs to integrate with other internal systems. So for example, right now we're integrating with a new accounting system, and it's super helpful to have a set of well-defined APIs. Like, as Spotify grows, we want to be able to build more complex products uh, and more complex business rules. And by having a, a good API design, this allows us to do that. And the customization part. There are a lot of payment providers or gateways out there today. None of them have the features that we have or need. And finally, I want to share with you what I've learned from my time at Spotify, why API design is so important. APIs make it easier for multiple teams to collaborate. You don't need to have so many meetings. You don't need to go down physically to a team and talk about it. You just read the documentation and you start building things. <coughs> APIs help you take a hard problem and divide it into more manageable domains. I mean, that's what we did with payments, right? If you look at the payments world from outside, it sounds super simple. I'm telling you, in the first two months I joined Spotify, it felt like I'm never going to be able to understand it. And then APIs require documentation. I think this is super important for a big organization. Documentation over time will actually improve quality and will help with knowledge sharing in your organization. And last but not least, APIs help you bring your ideas to life by allowing you to rapidly test, experiment, and learn. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. There we go. It's on. Great talk. Thank you for sharing your insights. Before we let you off the stage, are there any questions? Just real quick. We're wrapping up, um, but I would definitely like to give a chance for questions. Yep. Um, I'm curious about the checkout API. How did it evolve? Was it stateful from the beginning, or did you try stateless and then move to stateful? Or what's the history behind it? I can just give you this one. Uh, so your question was um, if we if it started to be uh, stateless. Yeah, it was stateless from the beginning. No, I mean, 
Well, first of all, you have to understand this all started, if I'm correct, 10 years ago. So I wasn't there for the, for the entire part of it. But from my understanding, uh, it wasn't so complicated to begin with. Like, if you think about it, we only had credit card payments, right? There wasn't the need to have this thing. But as soon as we started implementing more payment methods and more providers, and especially when you're dealing with local payment methods, that gets a bit more complicated. Like, I've pointed out the difference between paying with a credit card, which is instant, and it's not that complicated, right? And the credit card form doesn't change very often, so there's no need to create the state machine to be able to handle everything. But when you implement payment methods like um, bank transfer that can last you three to five days and you only get the response in five days or pay with your like, carrier billing so you have to send an SMS to actually complete the transaction. I think this um, started out as not being this very complicated state machine. It was just more we accept credit card payments and then when we started implementing more payment methods and working with more localized providers then we started thinking about okay this is going to take a lot of time. Um, and it, it really simplifies the work for client developers. Like, I think that's one of the, the best, uh, best reasons to have this state machine, because we don't want to do a client release every time we implement a new payment provider. All right, great. Horia, thank you so much for coming and sharing your insights. A small token of our appreciation, laptop back. I get my laptop back. <laughs> it's amazing. Thank you very much.